So you're invited, of course. All of our events are free and open to the public. If you, um, even the parking um, is free and open to the public. So if you parked in the OMU lot and you need to get your parking pass, uh, uh, just see Trice Hyman, who is uh, our administrative assistant, who is completing his tremendously successful first semester with the Schusterman Center. So thank you, Trice. Uh, okay, today's speaker is uh, Professor Brandon Katzier, uh, Oklahoma City University. Uh, we like, usually we rely on our OU talent, but when we can, we like to bring in people from the region as well uh, uh, to let our, our faculty get to know them and for them to get to know our program, although I think Brandon knows our program pretty well. Uh, Brandon uh, got his BA and MA uh, uh, in, at Oklahoma City University and Oklahoma <coughs> State University. He received his PhD in English from Louisiana State University, and he is uh, already the author of many publications, uh, ranging from uh, Saja Gaon, Arabic, Arabic Rhetoric and the Challenge of Rhetorical Histori Historiography, to William of Ockham's Rhetoric of Statism, Argumentation, Petrine Supremacy, and Secular Government in the Late Middle Ages, uh, he is uh, a wide, widely ranging intellect. Um, I, I know this because we sit sit next to each other in Shul on Saturday, uh, so we've had quite quite a few discussions over the last few years. And um, he is working now on a monograph called "Fruits of the Occident: Jewish Periodical Culture in Nineteenth-Century America." But today he's going to speak about. Um, uh, Herman Melville's uh, Clarel, which um, I must admit I have not read. I thought I was going to read it ahead of this talk, but when I took it out of the library, I found out it was eight, nine hundred pages, <laughs> or something like that, and that was maybe a little bit a uh, high uh, bar for me in the closing weeks of a busy semester. But uh, I'm very uh, delighted to introduce Professor Brandon Katz here. Hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Professor Levinson, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, most of us probably don't know uh, Herman Melville for his poetry, uh, so I appreciate you uh, uh, coming out on this cold day to hear a little bit about uh, the poetry of Herman Melville. Um, I don't typically like to begin talks about literature with biographical information, I'm a pretty firm believer in Barth's dictum that the author is dead. Uh, but I do want to begin today by talking a little bit about uh, Herman Melville, his background, and the trip to the Holy Land that inspired him to write this massive uh, epic poem, Clarel, an 18,000 line poem that details a religious pilgrimage, uh, that features Jews as central characters, and that calls into question the efficacy of religion, of science, and of politics in the 19th century. Melville was born in 1819, and he died uh, uh, in New York. He was born in New York in 1819, and he died there in 1891. He embodied uh, what uh, we might call a specifically American version of contentus mundi, of, of the idea that his generation was a poor imitation of those who came before him. And no wonder, uh, his paternal grandfather took a leading role in the Boston Tea Party, and his maternal grandfather was General Peter Gonesford, who was a member of New York's Dutch aristocracy and who commanded New York's 3rd Regiment and received commendations from Congress, as well as John Adams for defending Fort Stanwix from the British. Melville's father, on the other hand, was an unsuccessful businessman who moved the family back and forth from New York to Albany in pursuit of mostly failed business ventures. Um, Melville was baptized uh, and educated in the strict Protestantism of the South Dutch Reformed Church. He was a poor student, he made bad grades, and his teachers often suggested that they thought he was slow to read and write. At 21, he signed up to serve on a whaling ship which took him to the Polynesian Islands, and he deserted that ship, 
remaining on the island some four years before returning to the U.S. and writing his first major novel, Typey, an embellished story chronicling his adventures on the island. Believe it or not, Melville's literary career received mixed reviews in his own lifetime. His early novels, which recounted adventure-filled sea voyages and Polynesian life, made him a popular author in the 40s, in the 1840s. By the 1850s, he had published Moby Dick, which he considered his masterpiece, but the novel was not well received by reviewers, and it was a commercial disaster for Melville. Many of the reviews were scathing. For example, Mr. Melville never writes naturally. His sentiment is forced, his wit is forced, and his enthusiasm is forced. And in his attempts to display, to the utmost extent of his powers, fine writing, he has succeeded, we think, beyond his most sanguine expectations. The truth is, Mr. Melville has survived his reputation. If he had been contented with writing one or two books, he might have been famous. But his vanity destroyed all his chances for immortality, or even of a good name with his own generation. That was from the New York United States Magazine in January of 1852. Later that year, Henry Chorley uh, wrote in the London Athenaeum, this, about Moby Dick, this is an ill-compounded mixture of romance and matter of fact. The idea of a connected and collected story has obviously visited and abandoned its writer again and again and again in the course of composition. The style of his tale is in places disfigured by mad rather than bad English, and its catastrophe is hastily, weakly, and obscurely managed. Our author must be henceforth numbered in the company of the incorrigibles who occasionally tantalize us with indications of genius while they constantly summon us to endure monstrosities, carelessnesses, and other such harassing manifestations of bad taste as daring or disordered ingenuity can devise. We have little more to say in, repro in reprobation or in recommendation of this absurd book. Sounds like the peer review process, right? <laughs> Melville's subsequent no no novels, Pierre, Israel Potter, and Confidence Man, did little to restore his reputation, and he had increasing difficulty <clears throat> finding publishers for his works. Melville's wife and father-in-law fretted over his mental health, while the reviewers of Pierre and Israel Potter questioned Melville's psychological stability in the press. In 1857, the same year he published his final novel, The Confidence Man, Melville traveled to Britain and then on to the Holy Land. While in England, he spent a week with his friend, his sometime friend and mentor, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Hawthorne records this meeting in his diaries. He says, Melville, as he always does, began to reason of providence and futurity and of everything that lies beyond human ken, and informed me that he had pretty much, pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated. But still he does not seem to rest in that anticipation, and I think will never rest until he gets hold of a definite belief. It is strange how he persists and has persisted ever since I knew him, and probably long before, in wandering to and fro over these deserts as dismal and monotonous as the sand hills amid which we were sitting. He can neither believe nor be comfortable in his unbelief, and he is too honest and courageous not to try to do one or the other. If he were a religious man, he would be one of the most truly religious and reverential. He has a very high and noble nature, and better worth immortality than most of us. So why share these anecdotes about Melville? Well, I want to paint a picture of a person who is obviously depressed, uh, who's, who thinks that his uh, future as a writer is over, uh, who thinks that he can no longer make a living as a writer, and who certainly has no expectations of belonging to the generations. Uh, this is his view of himself and of his works as he travels uh, to the Holy Land. Clarel, A Poem and Pilgrimage in the Holy Land, was his first, it was Melville's last full-length book. It was published in 1876. 
at 150 cantos and nearly 18,000 lines. It's a very large, it's a large work. Like Moby Dick, it was commercially unsuccessful, and Melville is said to have taken out a loan to cover the cost of printing it. But like much of what Melville wrote, Clarell is prescient, advancing what many literary critics might call postmodern malaise, or a deep abiding skepticism of religion, of science, of geopolitics, and of the role of America in the world. The poem takes the shape of a pilgrimage. The title character, Clarell, a young Presbyterian theology student, travels to the Holy Land to rejuvenate his ebbing faith. Along the way, he falls in love with an American Jew, Ruth, and he travels from Jerusalem to Marsaba and then to Bethlehem. En route, he meets a variety of fellow pilgrims with whom he discusses the major political and intellectual changes of the 19th century. In his foreword to, North to Northwestern University Press's recent edition of Clarell, Herschel Parker writes that this poem remains the best-kept secret in American literature. Narrated as a journey through the Holy Land, Clarell does portray a surprising diversity of Jewish life. Clarell encounters his first Jew when he boards with Abdon, the black Jew, a descendant of the Cochin community from India, who has, in his old age, moved to the Holy Land less to live than end at home. Shortly thereafter, Clarell travels to the Western Wall and meets Ruth, an, an American Jew with whom he falls in love. Ruth becomes the focus of Clarell's desires and the prism through which he views Jewish life in Palestine. Predictably, however, Clarell is not only separated from Ruth by a cultural divide and by the seeming of vicissitudes of fate, but ultimately by the unforgiving landscape of the intoxicating Holy Land. Clarell is a pilgrimage within a pilgrimage. Like Melville himself, Clarell travels to the Holy Land to quell his spiritual and sort of existential anxiety, but upon arriving in Jerusalem, Ruth becomes the object of Clarell's devotion. When Ruth's father dies, Clarell is precluded from visiting her while her family sits Shiva, so he resolves to continue exploring Palestine until the conclusion of the mourning period. As Clarell travels through the wilderness to Marsaba, to Bethlehem, and ultimately back to Jerusalem, Ruth remains the focus of Clarell's thoughts and emotions, despite the many animated characters he meets along the way. Like most of the pilgrimage literature Clarell imitates, especially the Canterbury Tales, Clarell relies on its characters as symbolic representations of classes, religions, or ideas. So, Though Jews figure prominently in the poem, they sometimes seem to serve as a foil for Christians and Christianity, or for Clarell's prognostications on Catholicism, Protestantism, the sciences, or international politics. As a consequence, the few number of scholars who have commented on Clarell have typically overlooked the representation of Jews in the poem, despite Clarell's unparalleled preoccupations with Jews and Judaism, in the 19th century American literary canon. Today I want to argue that Melville's representation of Jews in Clarell is critical not only to understanding the, the author's attitude toward Jews, but also to understanding the allegorical project of Clarell and its complex meditation on religion in the global 19th century. Consciousness of the Hebrew Bible is embedded in the American literary tradition. The Christian Old Testament is a fertile text for 19th century American writers, and arguably none treat the Hebrew Bible with as much clarity, nuance, and, and certainly innovation as Melville. But despite his extensive use of the Hebrew Bible, neither Jews nor Judaism figure prominently in many of his written works aside from Clarell, a fact which makes their appearance in the poem all the more noteworthy. Clarell's Jews are certainly not the stock characters of 19th century British literature. Such literature tended to include Jews who embodied anti-Semitic tropes like Dickens' Fagin, Trollope's Melmont, or Demaryius Svengali. Even sympathetic portrayals like Eliot's and Daniel Deronda relied on certain stereotypes, right? Daniel is the famous son of a traveling musician who was in Europe and who abandons her connection to the Jewish people. 
Melville's Jews, by contrast, represent a variety of characters with backgrounds that might be familiar to the Jewish reader, but are certainly not typical representations of Jews in literature. I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the major Jewish characters in the poem and sort of articulating the way Melville portrays them. So Abdon, as I said, is the first Jew Clarel meets in Jerusalem. Of Abdon, Melville writes, Here was one, if question of his word be none, descended from those dubious men, the unreturning tribes, the ten, whom Shout and Halu wide have sought, lost children in the wood of time. Yes, he, the black Jew, stenting not, averred that ancient India's climb harbored the remnant of the tribes, a people settled with their scribes in far Cochin. There was he born and nurtured, and there yet his kin, never from true allegiance torn, kept Moses' law. Though so Abdon represents a community rarely portrayed in 19th century literature, he draws on a familiar trope in at least one way. He's come to the Holy Land to die, a common reason, obviously, for Jewish resettlement in the land, even into the decades of the 19th century. Traveling to the Western Wall with Abdon, Clarel meets Nathan. Nathan is an American convert to Judaism who lives in the Holy Land with his wife, Agar, and his daughter, Ruth. Nathan was raised as a Puritan and worked on a, rural, a farm in rural Illinois in the early 19th century. <coughs> Melville writes, Nathan had sprung from worthy stock, austere, ascetical, but free. But Nathan was dissatisfied with his Puritan upbringing. He doubted the Christian faith and took recourse in deist literature. It is Agar who saves Nathan from his skepticism. And Melville writes, <coughs> Was in a lake port new, a mark for grain, by chance he met, a Jewess who about him threw, else than Nerea's amorous net, and dubious wild. Twas Miriam's race, a sibyl breathed in Agar's grace, a sibyl but a woman too. He felt her grateful as the rains to her Thiam and the Rama plains in drought. Ere one herself did woo, wilt join my people. Love is power, came the strange plea in yielding hour. Nay, in turn Hebrew? But why not? If backward still the inquirer goes to get behind man's present lot of crumbling faith, for rearward shows far behind Rome and Luther what? The crag of Sinai. Here then plant thyself secure. Even in his newfound religion, though, Nathan is still restless, this time not because of his skepticism, but because of his desire to make good on the messianic pro uh, promise of Jewish liturgy, specifically the phrase that ends the Passover Seder next year in Jerusalem. Nathan communicates this desire, his desire to move to Jerusalem, to Agar, whose response Melville records. But she who mutely startled lay in the old phrase found new import in the blithe tone of bitter cheer that did the very speech subdue. She kenned her husband's mind austere, had watched his reveries grave. He meant no flourish of mere sentiment. Then what to do, or how to stay? Decry it, that would faith unsay. Withstand him, but she gently loved. And so with Hagar here it proved, as oft it may, the hardy will overpowered the deep munition still. Nathan and his family sell their possessions and leave rural Illinois for the Sharon Plain, determined with sea and tillage to help renew, help reinstate the Holy Land. Nathan's, for pur Nathan's purpose for moving to the Holy Land couldn't be more different from Abdon's. Whereas Abdon moves, moves from India to Jerusalem to die, Nathan moves with the hope of contributing to a rebirth, a rebirth of both the land of Israel and of the Jewish people in the land. But Nathan's journey doesn't go as planned. Nathan is soon robbed by wandering Arabs, and he sends his wife and young children to live in Jerusalem while he remains on his farm alone. With no recompense attainable where law was none, Nathan grew to hate the Arab inhabitants of the land, a trait that Melville connects to Nathan's upbringing and his Puritan forebear's hatred of Native Americans. Agar and Ruth try to convince Nathan to come to Jerusalem to live among the Jewish population but he refuses time and again, and he's killed when his farm and his house are burnt down. 
Margot is a Swedish Jew whom Melville brands an apostate. Margot is introduced as Clarel and others wander from Jerusalem through the wilderness en route to Bethlehem. A member of the travel party sees Margoth and remarks, This now is a Jew. German, I deem, but re-advised. An Israelite, say, Hegelized. Convert to science, for but see the hammer. Yes, geology. Described as a fallen son of Judah, Margoth makes geological puns on the Bible as he meets the religious pilgrims, making light of religion specifically to irritate the devout. Describing his geological finds, Margot says, Bear solid texts from Bible old, true rock of ages, he averred, to read before a learned board when home regained should meet his sight, a monograph he would indict, the theme, this crag. Margoth represents the battle between traditional religion and the sciences, a concept the poem addresses with its Christian characters at length. No longer interested in retaining faith in Judaism, Margoth replaces the Hebrew Bible's Rock of Ages with actual rocks from the Holy Land, rocks that he calls bare solid texts. Geology, for Margoth, takes the place of God and of the biblical texts, and though Margoth is seen by the other characters uh, to be an apostate, he's likened to Spinoza, that is, he's an apostate in a Spinozan sort of way, emphasizing the role of philosophy or, or, or science over religion, but concerns nevertheless with religious themes, right? He's only interested in the geology of the Holy Land. While not a character in the poem per se, Moses Mendelssohn does receive a lot of attention in Clarel, uh, while two Christians, Derwent and Rolf, argue over Jewish adherence to Judaism, a question which spawns a wide-ranging discussion of the Jewish question. Rolf, inclined to believe Jews are faithful or as faithful to their religion as anyone else, cites Moses Mendelssohn as someone plagued by doubt who ultimately retains his Jewishness. But Derwent, believing in the Jews' faithlessness and what he believes to be their adverse effects upon society generally, has a clever retort for Mendelssohn's reconciling of Judaism and modern philosophy. The conversation goes like this. See, there lived a Jew, no Alexandrine Greekish one, you know him, Moses Mendelssohn. Is it him you cite? True spirit stayed. He, though his honest heart was scourged by doubt Judaic, never laid his burden at Christ's door. He urged, admit the mounting flames and fold my basement. Wisely shall my feet the attic win for safe retreat. And he said that, poor man, he's cold. But was not this that Mendelssohn, whose Hebrew kinswoman's Hebrew son, baptized a Christian, worthily one? To summarize the religiosity and the development of Melville's Jewish characters, Abdon, a Cochin Jew, leaves India to die in Jerusalem, where he's lived long enough to start a successful business and become seemingly a pillar of Jerusalem's Jewish community. Nathan converts to Judaism in rural Illinois so that he can marry Agar, and they have two children, including Ruth. To his wife Agar's surprise, and certainly to her chagrin, he insists on moving to the Holy Land and living on the Sharon Plain where he's killed after a series of disputes with local Arabs. Margoth abandons Judaism for science and believes that scientific reason supersedes religious epistemology. And finally, it's pointed out that the family members of Moses Mendelssohn, cited initially as an example of a Jew who successfully weds modernity to traditional religion, have converted to Christianity. Each of these characters, with the possible exception of Abdon, represent the uneasy worldview of the modernizing 19th century. In showcasing the variety of Jewish life in the Holy Land and elsewhere, I argue that Melville portrays Jewish life in a familiar rather than an exotic way. The Jews of Clarel have many of the same problems and many of the same attitudes that other characters do, particularly on matters of religion, of politics, and of science. Derwent's complaints about Jews emphasize two factors common in anti-Semitic rhetoric. He accuses Jews of being greedy moneylenders, and he claims that Jews congregate in ghettos. He uses the, uh, the epithet old clothes to refer to Margot. And he argues that Jews are abandoning Judaism in favor of the liberal sciences. Derwent's charges are not unique. 
They're merely the recycled anti-Semitic rhetoric common in the 19th century. But what is unique, in my estimation, is Rolf's response to Derwin. Even if some Jews become irreligious, Rolf argues, Aaron's gemmed vest will long outlive Genevan cloth, nothing in time's old camper chest so little subject to the moth. But rabbis have their troublers too. Nay, if through dusty stalls we look, happily we disinter to view more than one bold free-thinking Jew that in his day with vigor shook faith's leaning power. Rawls' analysis of Judaism and its continuation is sober and uninflected by romance, exoticism, or millenarian fervor. He simply notes that Judaism has a long history, it seems more or less impervious to the ravages of time, and he argues that Jewish freethinkers have existed in centuries past, but this has not led to the dissolution of the religion as Derwin imagines. It is this philosophy of moderation that I think makes Melville's Clarel an important allegory of religion in the 19th century. While Melville's journals show that he travels to the Holy Land to combat depression, to combat sort of anxiety, much of Clarel attempts to combat the religious anxiety of an age. Melville demonstrates the hopelessness of religious fervor, but not of religion itself. It's Nathan who tries to imbue the Jewish liturgy with emotional fervor who dies, and Nathan's daughter, Ruth, suffers the consequences by dying of a sickness in the Holy Land. <clears throat> Clarel, who considers abandoning his Christian mission in the Holy Land to marry Ruth, suffers as Ruth dies. Melville critiques religious fervor of both the religious and the lovelorn. He suggests that religious fervor has also consumed the sciences. Rolf, often the voice in the poem of a uniquely Melvillian skepticism, asks, In one result whereto we tend, shall science disappoint the hope? Yea, to confound us in the end, new doors to superstition open. As years as years and annals grow, and action and reaction vie, and never men attain but know how waves on waves forever die, does all more enigmatic show. Clarel issues a clarion call for the 19th century with respect to religion, science, and society. Dogmatic fundamentalism sows the seeds for social chaos. No one set of ideas, whether religious or scientific, can address the many concerns of these increasingly uh, global or modernized audiences. Melville's allegory of religion in Clarel proposes the idea that we all live and must continue to live in these epistemological gray areas. Uniquely for 19th century literature, Melville illustrates this idea with Jewish characters and through the Christian character Rolf shows that Judaism and Jews are a religion and a people like any other. To any reader of Melville, it perhaps comes as no surprise that a central moral of the poem, if we could call it a moral, is the idea of curbing a fundamentalist impulse. Almost alone among American authors, Melville is wary of American colonialism, he's wary of Christian missionary activity, he shows this in his popular early novels. And notwithstanding the reviewer's objections I mentioned earlier, uh, Moby Dick is one of the most complex meditations on obsession and revenge ever written. But whereas the other works tend to combat single excesses, revenge, the quest for power, greed, Clarel combats excess in general just as it tends to find excess behind every modern belief system. To the extent that there is any scholarly consensus on Clarel, most read it as supporting the idea that Melville tended to a sort of depressed agnosticism later in his life. That, in other words, the primary focus of this poem sees Melville discounting religion altogether, or at least discounting the religiosity uh, earlier in his life. And it's true, many of the Christian characters in Clarel are self-evidently absurd. Like Twain's and Innocence Abroad, Melville's characters stumble upon the real sight of Christ's crucifixion, or a piece of the real cross, or the real cave in which Christ was really entombed dozens and dozens and dozens of different times in their journeys. Melville parodies this desire to prove sacred history with tourist attractions in much the same way that he darkly parodies Nathan's belief that he's reviving the Jewish people by farming alone on a plain in the Holy Land. 
So it's certainly true that religion invites Melville's mocking commentary uh, in Clarell. But to reach the conclusion that Clarell's primary focus is to discount religion, we would have to ignore Melville's treatment of Judaism and his parody of the sciences. As I mentioned earlier, Melville portrays a dynamic community of Jews living in Jerusalem, many of whom come from abroad. Similarly, in the introduction of Nathan, it is the narrator who talks of Rome and Luther as the present lot of man's crumbling faith. But behind the crumbling edifice of these modern faiths stands the crag of Sinai, a crag to which the poem says, you can root yourself. At the close of the poem, when Derwent and Rolf argue over the faithful, faithfulness or faithlessness of Jews, Rolf suggests Judaism will not crumble in the face of modernity because it's already withstood free thinkers who with vigor shook faith's leaning tower. Unlike many Christians of the 19th century who saw Jews' adherence to Judaism as a stubborn and mindless clinging to an outdated religion, Melville seems to suggest that it's Judaism's antiquity and its ability to absorb its own free thinkers that guarantees a certain historical resilience. It should be noted that while the poem talks very little about Islam, there is an aside in the text which suggests that the future of the political world order will be divided mostly between Muslims and Catholics because Protestantism serves only as an incubator for atheism. Now, it's difficult to know how seriously to take these kinds of asides in the text because there are thousands of them. Uh, but it's at least obvious that Melville doesn't believe that modernity will simply make religion disappear. This brings me to my second point, which is that Melville explores the limits of science just as much as he delineates the limits of religion. Reflecting on the, on the legends uh, told to Christian tourists by priests living in Jerusalem, Melville writes, The abbots and the palmer rest, the legends follow them and die. Those legends which, be it confessed, did bring them nearer to the sky, did nearer woo it to their hope, of all that saints, of all that seers and saints avow, then Galileo's telescope can bid it unto prosing science now. The sciences may communicate knowledge, but they do so in prose, in a language that doesn't have the power to animate peoples and their values and their cultures. In keeping with his textual metaphors, Melville, in the passage I uh, read earlier, has the scientist Margot discard the Hebrew Bible for his blank texts. Rocks hewn from the Holy Land. Margoth is vain enough to then later imagine that his scientific monograph will take the place of the biblical text. We all have colleagues like this, right? <laughs> complaining, that his, uh, complaining about his compatriot's romanticized view of the Holy Land, Margoth says, The plain, the veil, lot C, it needs we scientists remand back from old theologic myth to geologic hammers. Then, talking about Jerusalem, he says, Stale is she, lay flat the walls and let the air in, that folk no more may sicken there, wake up the dead and let there be rails, wires from Olivet to the sea, with a station in Gethsemane. Clarell ridicules fundamentalism, whether it takes the form of the scientists, or the, whether it takes the form of the sciences, whether it takes the form of romance, whether it takes the form of religion. While Melville himself may have labored in increasing obscurity and penury during his lifetime, most of his works are now considered some of the towering achievements of American literature. And while the phrase, ahead of his time, is so overused as to be more or less meaningless, I do think it's safe to say that works like Moby Dick and The Confidence Man are ahead of their time, right? Both in terms of pro style and in terms of Melville's pervading skepticism. But if books like Moby Dick, Confidence Man, or um, Benito Serino, or others, have found their way into the sort of American popular literary canon, or the American popular imagination, in the century and a half since Melville's death, Clarell has yet to do so. Next year marks Melville's 200th birthday, and I want to suggest that the time for Clarell has come now at last. Now is the time to seek out works of American literature, or artifacts of American culture that root out fundamentalism and extremism, whatever the type, and that implore us to be comfortable with moderation rather than excess. Spare fervid speech, Melville writes, but for the rest, 
be not extreme, midway is best. Betwixt rejection and belief, shadings there are, degrees in brief. Thank you.